When you think of Jujutsu Kaisen, there's one man that comes to mind. Satoru Gojo. His birth alone shifted the balance of power in the world as he was the first in 400 years to be blessed with both the six eyes and limitless technique. He is literally the strongest sorcerer of the modern era and possibly of all time. <laughs> However, today we're going to be counting down the top eight times that Gojo proved he is the most badass character in Jujutsu Kaisen. Kicking things off with his first appearance in the series. When Gojo showed up to save Megami from the freshly incarnated Sukuna, I think we all fell in love with him. The sheer disrespect shown by Gojo was badass enough, but to do it to the literal king of curses, the one in a million worst case scenario was insane. He was toying with Sukuna who, albeit was only at one finger, but still. The fact that Gojo just sat on his back and told him that he's gonna show off because his students were watching was too damn good. And although this is kinda a different moment, I'm grouping them together, as when Sukuna popped up again to trash talk Gojo further, claiming he put him at the top of his hit list, not only was this seen as an honour by Gojo, it didn't even scare him, as he confidently declared that he'd win, even against a full power Sukuna. And as you'll see later in this video, I don't think anyone can disagree with him. Next on our list has to be Gojo breaking through the anti-Gojo barrier at the Jujutsu High to use Hollow Purple. Like, the fact that an anti-Gojo barrier was even needed in the first place just goes to show the kind of godly being that we're working with here. In order for such a thing to even exist, the trade-off was to allow everybody else through the barrier. So that means that technically Gojo is at least equal to every other person on the planet. It all made sense though when you see that despite being miles away, he instantly discerned who, what and where Hanami was and fired off his most powerful technique, Hollow Purple. This combines the attraction of his blue technique and the repulsion of red, bringing an extraordinarily destructive wave of infinity into reality, completely annihilating anything in its path from existence at the speed of light. We can make this assumption because hollow purple was stated to be an imaginary mass, thus making it a massless object, aka a tachyon, which can travel at the speed of light. However, Nanami managed to escape before Gojo could land this attack. Wouldn't be so lucky next time though. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves there as first I want to rewind back to Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. After Gojo managed to delay Yuta's execution, making him his new student, he sent him on a mission. It ended in success, technically. However, Rika, the Queen of Curses, was let loose during it. Something the Jujutsu higher-ups did not take lightly to, stating that if it was to happen again, they would proceed with Yuta's execution. To which Gojo spied Iron chillingly reminds them all that, should it come to it, just remember that he's on Yuta's side. Remember, Gojo's entire goal is to rebuild the twisted and broken Jujutsu society by fostering a generation of new sorcerers trained with love and compassion. Hence why he made sure the executions of Yuta and Yuji didn't happen. And we've seen this beginning to pay off too as Yuta, who was sent to kill Yuji following Gojo's imprisonment, decided to abide by his sensei's will and instead protect Yuji. This wouldn't be the only time Gojo declared he should kill the higher-ups of Jujutsu society though, as after Yuji's initial death, Gojo revealed that perhaps he really should just kill them all. And as we saw later in the manga, even if Gojo wasn't the one to kill them, they still got what they deserved. Now this next moment is totally iconic. It's Gojo versus Jogo. Everything in this fight just encapsulated what we love about Gojo because it was both badass and funny. Building up to this, Jogo really believed that he had what it took to take down Gojo. He hit him with a powerful attack to blow him up and actually thought that he'd done the job that easily. Even going as far to call Gojo no different than just any ordinary human. But that's when Jogo shit his pants and got a sense of the trouble he found himself in. Because as the smoke cleared, Gojo reappeared. And in his his glowing confidence tricked Jogo into holding hands with him only to ruin his day from that moment forward. Gojo continued to do what he does best and rattle the special grade cursed spirit by disrespecting him when he reduced this death match to a mere classroom after bringing Yuji to the scene to learn about domain expansions all because Gojo was that confident as in his own words to Jogo. Yo, I'm all... <laughs> 
And so Gojo casted his unlimited void and subsequently tore off Jogo's head, putting an end to their fight before Hanami stepped in to save him at the final moment. Now, arguably Gojo's most iconic moment was his round two fight with Toji. After the former Zenin assassin thought he had killed Gojo, he sure was surprised to see his crazy eyes stood before him alive. The thing is, Gojo was more than alive in this moment. He was enlightened. When Gojo had his neck stabbed, instead of fighting back, he focused everything he had into the reverse cursed technique to heal himself. Being on the brink of death meant that Gojo had understood the core of cursed energy and became an enlightened being. Throughout heaven and earth, he alone was the honored one. Even after a short back and forth, Toji didn't stand the chance as this awakened Gojo hit him with the first ever hollow purple. The assassin's final words were to inform Gojo of his son Megami, who was scheduled to be sold up to the Zenin clan in a few years, and that Gojo should do with that information what he pleases, leading him to eventually adopting Megami, making him the first addition to his class of new sorcerers built in Gojo's image. Now, you can't mention Gojo without bringing up Shibuya. Although the event marked a rare loss for Gojo that wasn't before some of his most incredible moments in the series. In spite of knowing he was entering a trap, Gojo was confident in his ability, as even when Hanami blocks the exit, Gojo tells them not to worry as he doesn't plan on running away. The plan was to then flood the station with humans as a means to try and restrict Gojo from going all out. You'd really think they'd have learned their lesson by now, wouldn't you? Reality soon settled in though when Gojo brutally murdered Hanami in front of Jogo. And when I say brutally, I mean Gojo made sure all that remained was dust. Suddenly, a train full of disfigured humans appear who begin eating the civilians trapped in the station whilst Mahito joins the fight against Gojo. The curses believed that they had him cornered, as his only choice was to use his domain expansion. But again, the curses gambled on his humanity, stopping from doing so due to the amount of civilian casualties it had caused. Remember, Gojo's unlimited void floods the brains of those inside with an infinite amount of knowledge and sensation to the point where they're unable to even move due to the overload. It quite literally gives the user everything, leaving them with nothing to do. Gojo had a trump card though. He had no way of telling if it would work, but it was his only choice. And so he cast his domain expansion for 0.2 seconds. This was a short enough amount of time to stop every non-sorcerer's brain being totally overloaded as it only resulted in a flood of information worth half a year. It was unlikely they'd suffer any long lasting effects and those that were badly affected would be able to rejoin normal society just two months later. For Gojo though, this meant he could wipe out a thousand of Mojito's disfigured humans in a display of pure skill, emerging from the aftermath carrying the skulls of his enemies. It all came crashing down, however, as that pesky Kinjaku just had to ruin it all by opening the prison realm, subsequently sealing Gojo away. And in doing so, just sent the entire Jujutsu society into complete chaos, launching the Culling Games. Meanwhile, the Jujutsu higher-ups, who we've established Gojo really isn't a fan of, decided to make the unsealing of Gojo a crime. Luckily though, Satoru's hard work at investing in a young and new Jujutsu society, which he took under his wing, paid off because they said, fuck the rules. We want our sensei back. And so after a couple ups and downs, and by downs, I mean Sakuna has taken over Megami's body and is almost at full power. Other than that though, pff, everything seems pretty fine. As finally, after joining forces with Angel and Hanakurasu, they were ready to unseal Gojo from within the prism realm. Unsure about the mental stability of Gojo after being trapped in a timeless dimension for what could have felt like an eternity for him, they treated the unsealing like a bomb that was about to go off. And boy, was it. Despite Kinjaku hiding the prison realm 8,000 meters deep inside of the Japan Trench, guarded by cursed spirits, Gojo emerged in his finest Toji cosplay with a little skin fade. Seriously though, where did all this drip come from? <laughs> Regardless, he skipped past the reunion with his friends and went straight to war, pulling up in front of Kenjaku. Whilst Kenny was trying to lighten the mood a little bit with some sarcastic remarks, Gojo had other ideas, stating, you should pick your words more wisely, as they're about to be your last. Seriously though, Gojo's confidence in his skill to beat an opponent has to be one of my favorite things about him. 
It's such a cool flip on the trope, as it usually tends to be the villains who are the overpowered cocky ones. But hey, like I said, when you're a menace to society, what else do you expect? Now talking of Gojo being sure that he'd get the dub, his most badass moment has to be the entire fight with Sukuna. I mean, it's the battle that everybody had waited years for. The strongest in history versus the strongest of the modern day. The disgraced one versus the honoured one. Both characters represented the polar opposites of each other. Sukuna desires to stand alone at the top, above both humans and curses as he identifies as neither, whilst Gojo aims to unite society through both love and compassion to enter a new era free of chaos, despite being born with the ability to stand side by side with Sukuna. But of course, there was more on the line in this fight than just of the future of the world, as it was also Gojo's son, Megami, who was now Sukuna's newest vessel. So, you'd expect Gojo to hold back, right? Come on. Really? You've gotten to this point in the video and you still think that? Have you not learned your lesson by now? Gojo never holds back back. Which was made all the more obvious when he approached his biggest opponent by immediately unleashing a 200% hollow purple, catching Sukuna off guard, incinerating his hand. Even inside Sukuna's domain, Gojo showcased his skill by surviving the constant onslaught of dismantle by healing his wounds with a reversed curse technique each time, whilst the two also used the domains effortlessly back to back to back in an immense display of Jujutsu tug of War. Despite that, it was here that Gojo proved to everybody in the Jujutsu Kaisen community that he truly did deserve the title of being the strongest. Because had it not been for the Ten Shadows technique that Sukuna had inherited by taking over Megumi's body, he'd have been dead already. Meaning that even if Gojo did face off against a peak Sukuna from the Heian era, odds are he still would have won. After all, Sukuna wouldn't have had Maharaga there to summon, saving his ass for like the third time in a row. Now, if you want to learn everything about Gojo's life, from his birth, to his death, to his revival, to what could very well possibly be his death again, then you really have to click this video on your screen right now.